Church, I would like to invite you to turn with me to today's focus passage, which is Matthew chapter 6, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 15 if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you that's the only... to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is present in that secret place. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your sins. There's no wrong way to pray, I say with a wink and an asterisk, but there might be better ways to pray. Stephen Matson of Red Letter Christians tells us of some prayer habits that we are all guilty of. Like, for instance, we use cliches. We're sitting there at McDonald's eating a double quarter pounder with cheese, and we say, Dear Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. <laughs> but pastor, there's a tomato on the sandwich. <laughs> so we use cliches. We also turn prayer into a personal wish list. If your prayers sound more like your Amazon shopping list or cart you might be praying in the wrong way. He also said we don't use creativity or imagination. Here's a good one. We talk, but we almost never listen. Perhaps the worst of all is that we use inactive, passive prayer, where we see our prayer as completely passive and separate and unrelated to our transformation or our lifestyle. I agree with every one of his points and confess that I'm guilty of every single one. Criticizing anyone for the way they pray is not exactly my cup of tea, but I think that we could all approach the practice of prayer with a little bit more uh, intentionality, wouldn't you say? Both in the ways that we imagine God, the ways that we speak about God, the ways that we talk about God, the ways that we in turn believe we should respond. And I think that's how God wants it. Prayer has been in the news lately for a couple of reasons. 
One, every poll and survey continues to show what's been shown now for several years, that belief in God continues to decline as a percentage across the country. So what does that mean for prayer? How many people are practicing prayer now? And I promise you that when I planned this series several months ago, I had no idea that the Supreme Court would hand down a ruling regarding the way that a coach could pray or not pray in the middle of a football field. Completely and utterly unplanned on my part. So prayer is on the minds of people. It's on the minds of Christians, but also everyone else in our country right now, I think. And so it's probably best that we stop and ask, what is prayer? What's it meant for? How do we practice it? How do we not practice it? Because prayer affects our actions, it affects our thoughts about God. In the same way, mindless recitation can be habit-forming, and we can spout off inadequate words about God and about the world around us, which is why we now enter into this five-week series called Pray Like This, which is a series on the Lord's Prayer, where each of the next few weeks we will break down the individual clauses in the Lord's Prayer, unpack them, learn what they mean for us. We'll consider the spiritual and practical components of praying. We jump in today's scripture right in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, which carries some of Jesus' words about discipleship in the kingdom of God on earth. And this Lord's Prayer towards the end of our passage today actually follows a rather critical and challenging word from Christ about the spiritual practice of prayer, of giving, and after this scripture, of fasting. So the spiritual disciplines, including prayer and those practices, Jesus says right off, they're not intended to be a public show or to draw attention to yourself. He says these acts are intentionally and inherently God-centered and anti-selfish. So don't make them all about you. He says, don't pray on the street corners if you're speaking to God and listening to God. Why would you be doing that for others to see? He says, you don't need to draw attention to yourself or make it a show for others. Jesus says that even in a religious building, you can pray in the wrong way. I will confess that that took me off guard this time. The fact that Jesus says, you see these people praying in the synagogues, and I said, well, of course they're praying in the synagogues. That's where they're supposed to be praying, right? But he says there's still a way that even in a religious gathering, you can pray and make it all about yourself, make it selfish, just to draw attention to you. He goes on to say the proper way to pray really is to go into a closet and shut the door. It'll just be you and God in that moment. And yeah, I think you could take that passage quite literally. That's a good practice. But even so, the larger point is that you must remove yourself or take yourself to a place where you can focus on God and listen to the Spirit's voice. It's not just about whether you're in eyesight of others or not. What you're saying matters, whether there are others around or you're in a closet. Speak honestly, speak truthfully, Jesus says. God already knows the longings of your heart. Don't babble on and on and use filler words just to go longer. He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Think about that phrase for a moment. How often do you pause after our Father in heaven? How often do you pause after hallowed be your name? What does that phrase mean to you? What comes to mind? Who comes to mind? Is God distant and not engaged in your life or the affairs of the world? Is God angry? Is God angry and passive or angry and active? Is God benevolent? Is God loving passively or is God loving actively in our world? 
Raoul Williams sees this first part of the prayer as a petition that people may look upon God's name as holy, as something that inspires awe and reverence in our hearts, and that we may not trivialize it by making God a tool for our purposes, to put other people down or as a sort of magic to make ourselves feel safe. You see, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus continues a long-standing practice of speaking adoration and truth about God at the commencement of a time of prayer. In Exodus, Moses and Miriam pray this, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. In 1 Samuel, Hannah says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Solomon's prayer of dedication in 2 Chronicles says, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. And in 2 Kings, Hezekiah prays, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Do your prayers begin with moments of reverence such as that? Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. He's challenging us to begin our prayers with a posture of worship from the opening statement so that we may be reminded that we commune with a holy, magnificent, and powerful, yet caring and engaged and loving God. With Christian prayer, everything begins and ends with God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and the crucified and risen Christ, the one who reigns in love, and the Spirit who sustains the church as we bear witness to the love of Christ. Our focus, our orientation in prayer and in practice begins and ends with a holy, just, righteous, truthful, and loving God. So when prayer becomes attention-seeking or thoughtless or ego-filling, we immediately, even at the start, contaminate the essence of our prayer. So as judgmental and as critical as it sounds, yeah, there's a wrong way to pray. There's a wrong, wrong way to pray. But the good news is that it is not in intelligence or in age or in wealth or length of church membership or in the number of times you use words like thee, thou, thy, and thine or whether we use the word trespasses or debtors. It is in our humble, eager, selfless approach to the throne of grace through which we can take part in prayer at its best couple of challenges for you as you think about this Lord's Prayer and through the next few weeks. I first challenge you to begin every prayer with an acknowledgement of the one with whom you speak, our Father in heaven. When we begin our prayers with an acknowledgement of who God is, we should use our words carefully but also confidently. Author Jonathan Merritt writes, God is not a punk who sends tornadoes to kill innocents and dangles sinners over a fire. No, comprehending God isn't easy, but we can at least say as we begin our prayers that God is an all-compassionate Father whose first name is love. Begin there. This does not mean that we rip out Bible passages that speak of judgment or wrath, but Jesus tells us to address God in our prayers as our Father in heaven. And I acknowledge to you today and understand that not everyone's regard for parents is entirely positive. But we can have faith that God is the all-perfect, all-loving parent. God wants to hear from you, or Jesus would not have told us to pray. God is a loving parent who receives our words, our fears, our angers, our doubts, our requests, and our joys with power and love. So pray with confidence that God does indeed hear your prayers. Hallowed be your name. The verses leading up to the Lord's Prayer are critical and challenging even to this Lord's Prayer. This 
wording from Jesus or Jesus' pointed words might quite possibly emerge from religious leaders who loved to hallow themselves in front of others, who prayed on the street corners or on the synagogues incessantly, or who gave and made sure that people saw them donating, or who fasted and made sure everyone knew, oh, how hungry they were. To make something not about you is inherently countercultural. That everything doesn't begin and end with you, but the Father is countercultural. The fact that the resources that you are given are not a means to your end, but to bless others in God's name, that's countercultural. The idea that prayer is not an action designed to garner attention or likes on social media, well, that's a countercultural action in and of itself. If the Christian life is truly about self denial and taking up your cross daily, then our prayers must model that directive. Richard Foster says that prayer catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. Real prayer is life creating and life changing. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. So yeah, most of the time I agree with the sentiment there is no wrong way to pray. But I think prayer is too important a gift from God to simply leave to our own devices, which is why I'm thankful today that we have a passage of scripture where Jesus says, pray like this. We'd better pay attention and look to his example as the best way to pray and to practice our faith. And I challenge you to use this prayer as a model for yourself this week and beyond. Most of the things that we want to pray about are taken care of within this prayer. It is small in scale, but huge in its coverage. You might wish to pray it slowly, pausing every few words to hold before God that which is on your heart. You might wish to use it at the beginning or end of a more extended prayer, whether to set up your prayer or to sum up all that you've just said. You may wish to say it slowly, over and over again, to go down deeply into the loving presence of God, into the power of the gospel, to bring bread, forgiveness, and rescue. That is the Lord's Prayer. We say it not just in this church, but we join with millions of Christians across the world who speak this prayer today and throughout the week. We celebrate that. We find unity in Christ's church. Professor Clayton Schmidt says, there is a sense of solidarity in knowing that Christians around the globe are praying together. And these words always unite us. Our Father, who art in heaven, may these words be on our hearts and minds as we begin this series and as we go about this week. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer and specifically the way that you taught us to pray. We pray that as we say this prayer even more, that it would not be mindless recitation, but that we would reflect on each and every word and phrase. And that we would have confidence and faith that you hear our prayers. Help us to continually fight our egos and our desire to bring attention to ourselves so that we can focus in on you and doing your will in our prayers and in our practice. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.